as uh, Chris mentioned, Alex and I worked on Bletchley Flyover for the last couple of years. And this presentation is a sort of run through of um, all of that and what, what we learned along the way. We could probably talk for hours about it. So we've tried to cram in uh, um, quite a lot here. A um, bit from design side and then a bit from uh, Alex's side on how he actually got it built. So we'll go through a, a, a brief history of Bletchley Flyover and, and the background of the project. The initial work that was done on the sort of initial scheme, as I call it, initial design, then the change to the partial reconstruction scheme, which is where, uh, where I came in. Then uh, so around that, some safe by design considerations, how we tried to build that into the design. Now, Alex will cover the implementation and then some summaries at the end. So the project itself is uh, East West Rail as a whole is to get the re reopen the line from Oxford to Cambridge. And phase two that we're working on is to open the line from Vista to Bedford. And Bletchley flyover you can see is here, just takes the line over the West Coast main line and a few other things. I won't read for all this stuff. This is what's happening on the rest of uh, East West Rail. So a history of Bletchley Flyer itself. Uh, here's a picture of it. I'm not sure the exact date of this, but fairly short. Yeah, 1958, that one. Okay. Uh, it was, yep, yeah, built between 1958 and 1960. Connects the Oxford line to the Bletchley, uh, Bletchley Bedford Midland line. Provides a separate, a grey separation over the West Coast main line. Uh, because before this was built, uh, trains had to go across a number of switches to cross the line, and that slowed everything down. However, it was closed to passenger services in 1968, following the Beecham report, and has only been used since then for heavy freight trains and train stabling. So it never really uh, saw a lot of use. Here's an aerial view of the flyover. Uh, let's see, it's sorry, move that out of the way. It's about six hundred five meters long. Has had thirty seven spans originally. Crosses three roads and the West Coast Main Line. And it's a mix of all sorts of uh, forms of construction: pre, uh, post tension concrete, normal reinforced concrete, and uh, yeah, effectively four different types of structure, which added to the, the challenge. So I'll just run through those quickly. Uh, what we call the Northern spans are simply supported uh, pre-stressed concrete beams. Sorry, sorry, I'm moving some things out of the way of my cursor. Uh, about 17 meter span supported on reinforced concrete piers. And the original scheme here was to general repairs and strengthening and uh, waterproofing new bearings. So that the main issue being, which I'll come on to more later, that virtually every pier was failing in its assessment under traction and braking load. So it needed strengthening. The next section is the West Coast mainline spans through here, where they got a bit more creative uh, in the original design. So here, the deck is still simply supported pre-stressed, pre-tensioned concrete uh, decks, but they are supported via half joints on pre-stressed, post-tensioned concrete crossheads and post-tensioned columns. And I'll, I'll, you'll see on the next slide, but uh, the scheme here involved extensive strengthening work, replacement of bearings, uh, replacement of the cross heads under the decks, um, grouting up of existing post-tensioning. So a lot, a lot of complex work around the West Coast Main Line. So that's the... Uh, vertically post-tension piers 
and the cantilever piers so they could see it on site. So again, these piers were failing in traction and braking, um, particularly these due to the, the torsion as well being put on them. Um, here's a bit of a view of that pier in particular. So you can see they ver it was vertically post-tensioned and horizontally post-tensioned. Then it supported a precast post-tensioned cross beam on the knuckles up here. And then that beam in turn supported the decks on half joints. So a, a lot of features that we uh, were very difficult to modify and um, you know, that we were trying to avoid today. The moving a bit further along is the spans over Buckingham Road over here. These are a mix of precast um, in situ with again some po vertical post tensioning, and the scheme here again was all around strengthening those piers. Uh, yeah, I guess because of the visibility, they tried to get a bit more uh, aesthetic, put a bit more of a, an aesthetic uh, feature into it. So the breakdown here is. Uh, Reinforced concrete piles and pile caps, cellular, uh, vertically post-tensioned piers with post-tensioned heads. These are yeah, in yellow is cellular reinforced concrete spans sat on uh, little rocker bearings hidden in the piers there, and then the orange was uh, post-tensioned infill spans. And this here, you can see where there's uh, pits put under the original piers to grout up the post tensioning. And these are the hollow piers, post tension crossheads, sadly the spans. <clears throat> so again, a lot of slightly unusual um, techniques going on. And more halving joints with uh, bearings that are very difficult to access for maintenance. Look, here's a picture of it shortly after it was built. And the final form of construction was what we call the built in the second phase, the southern spans. So what you can see is this, this is pier 11 and it looks like an abutment. And we did wonder why sort of a third of the way along there was pier 11 looking like an abutment. So it appears at some point they, wherever the original abutment and embankment was, they decided to go further south. Uh, we're not sure why, whether that was, they needed to access adjacent to it or there was a problem with the uh, landslips. So a number of additional piers were built where again, they changed the form of construction. So now the spans are voided, post-tensioned, uh, concrete beams, but on simple RC piers. And the scheme here was to strengthen these piers and uh, general refurbishments. So that's a, a history and a quick run through all the different forms of construction. And this next bit is just about the early works that were done. So, excuse me. Based on the assessments with the RA, the uh, traction and braking node, most of the piers failed and needed strengthening. The half joints were uh, only RA5 and in poor condition. Bearings appeared in poor condition. And extensive strengthening and remedial works were required for this. And you can see some of the half joints here, which just looked very bad. Um, and the bearings looking in a very poor condition. Uh, and the main, the main reason why we were struggling with traction braking appears to be that the traction braking load has doubled since the original design. So while all this work was going on, uh, something happened, which was the collapse of the Mirandi Bridge in 2018. And this 
got everyone very worried about the post tensioning. So there was a, <clears throat> a requirement for more post tension special investigations, inspections, more scrutiny around the hidden elements, sort of uh, hidden bearings, um, halving joints, all this post tensioning, voided elements, uh, and a requirement to do a post tension risk assessment. Out of this, we found that uh, there were big problems with the post tensioning. 90% uh, of the tendons were not grouted, and where they had grouted, it was partial. So you can see empty ducts there. 10% um, of the ducts contained water. And testing was done to pull on some of these bars. Many of them had uh, lower strength than you'd expect. And it quite it varied quite a bit. And because of the water, there was a potential of corrosion in the lower areas of this vertical post tensioning where it's very hard to get in and inspect, it, or impossible essentially, to inspect these bars and check whether they were corroded or not. So this made people start to think about the original scheme and whether it was appropriate or whether they really should look at a different route. And this is due to you know, the continual discovery of, of defects and issues as every element's opened up. Uh, difficulty demonstrating that the post tensioning was safe to reuse or could safely be grouted up. And associated with all of that and the design continuing to change was uh, uh, escalating cost, the, uh, uncertainty over the program and, and a lot of risk. Uh, also, this scheme, this bridge happens to be on the critical path for East West Rail because it's uh, needed to bring all, uh, a lot of material in for the rest of East West Rail. So the project really wanted a lot of certainty. So uh, here are a couple of other things that were in people's minds as well. Um, issues with the original scheme that we should think about in the new scheme. Uh, one was the train derailment in 1998 in uh, Germany, where uh, the uh, train derailed and uh, it hit a bridge pier, causing a major collapse. And that was a particular risk with those West Coast piers we were seeing earlier, the uh, vertically post tension piers being so close to the West Coast main line. <clears throat> Half joints is another area where any failure could be sudden. And this is a failure in, in 2016. And there are a number of half joints in the original scheme. And as I mentioned earlier, the post tension failure of Morandi Bridge. So having these things having happened in the past uh, and seeing how uh, uh, how flyover was uh, put an end really to the original scheme. And uh, the project came up um, with a new scheme, which uh, I was brought in as the designer of, or lead design. So uh, the this now is a run through what we ended up doing the new the new scheme. So the key aims were removing vulnerable piers near the west coast main line removing hidden critical elements, particularly with brittle failure modes, i.e. half joints, removal of all vertical post tensioning, and maximizing DFMA, uh, which relates to the program, getting certainty and getting it built in time for what the project needed. But bearing in mind that a lot of time had been spent on a, on a previous scheme and we were starting from scratch. Another advantage of a new scheme would it would enable the use of continuous wild rail which wasn't possible on the the previous uh, viaduct and this reduces track maintenance and the design around the west coast 
because we're starting from a new build. We could minimise impact on the railway, um, which Alex will cover later, I'm sure. So here's an overview of uh, the new scheme, which was these spans where we've asked the peers, um, pre-stress decks, we were just refurbishing. <clears throat> Through West Coast, pretty much total rebuild to get rid of all those post-tension piers, piers near the West Coast. Through Buckingham Road, the piers were vertically post-tensioned uh, and some of them were beyond saving. So it's here it was new or strengthened piers and new decks. And through West Coast and Buckingham Road, new decks. And the advantage of one of other advantages, this left any uh, only refurbished decks well away from the railway. So they're more easy to maintain. <clears throat> so West Coast reconstruction. You can see a, a virtual image of here. We put in a priestess concrete deck with a RC slab spanning perpendicular. This led us put the uh, well, I'll move on to the next slide. So this is supported on RC piles, pile caps, and shallow abutment piers. It removed all substructures and piers from uh, in between the lines from the 10 foot in here where there used to be piers. And the new piers are very robust and designed for derailment impact loading. Um, and here's an aerial view of the box virtually done. So part of the challenge here was the uh, geometric constraints. The, the West Coast was already there. The BFO line above, we could only lift so much. We could only get so close to the, to the tracks with the abutments because we needed to provide a minimum walkway room. And <laughs> so we there's only so much construction depth that we could get to work. So this resulted in us needing these beams very close together. And, but it did allow us to slightly improve the headroom to meet the minimum for TSI compliance, which was a win. Uh, and enabled yes, us to get the piers far enough away to enable adjacent line working. Uh, but yeah, track above, we lifted as much as we could but due to the adjacent train station, we couldn't lift uh, far enough to achieve a uh, normal headroom here. And that's the uh, yeah, 25 meter span and a 1.2 meter construction depth. And here you can see from above one other big constraint we had was the very limited room on the east side where the boundaries here and the number of properties here so we were stuck between the west coast main line and these properties in an area where it's very difficult to access we were limited to 600 diameter piles but we had to design to modern loading which includes a 400 ton kirov crane so that led us to sort of absolutely maximizing the number of piles we could get under this area and working very closely with our geotech colleagues to get that to work. Yeah. So the piers themselves, they're formed from shell units, precast sill beams, the shells dropped onto star bars below, the sills above. I won't cover these too much now because Alex is going to talk about them a bit more. Uh, the whole design itself was uh, designed to work around the railway. So the position of the piers, the yellow hoarding was set to allow retroffing and the West Coast uh, to continue throughout with uh, minimal possessions. Early staging as well. Probably our early colleagues could talk a lot about that. There was a lot of careful staging done to enable the the box to be built around the early without disrupting the West Coast Main Line. <clears throat> the design of the beams incorporated uh, both the temporary works, but also the 
Oerly through casting channels or casting um, anchors. So this was all switched over very smoothly during a, a May bank holiday possession where the Oerly was taken down. New beams were put in and Oerly quickly bolted up. So that worked really well. Although from a design side, coordinating these fixings uh, over 103 beams was quite a challenge. And that's a few from below, all the early in place. Okay. Buckingham Road was similar deck, composite deck with Y beams. The piers were retained where possible. And what we did here was uh, decommission the original post tensioning and used it as just normal rebar in combination with uh, the existing rebar that was already in the piers. And we also uh, changed around the articulation <clears throat> to relieve traction braking load from piers that couldn't take it onto new piers that we built either side. <clears throat> so here's a visualization of what it looks like. So these piers have had the post tension decommissioned. The strengthening block you can't see on the back there. New sill beams on the top, and then new decks. And this is a view of the the strengthening. Um, also, to remove the hidden elements here, we filled these up with uh, foam concrete to remove the voids. Now the deck on top. Um, as these walkway units. So this was another DFMA point was um, <clears throat> something the delivery team were really keen on was not casting the walkway in situ, having pre-cast units. So again, a, a big challenge for us from making sure it was safe, stability wise, making sure it could be tied down and coordinating <clears throat> Uh, pre-cast bars with in situ bars to make sure it all tied together. But it, it, although it was harder was from design side, it, it really worked um, on site and uh, let them work entirely from the deck and drop these units in. Northern spans, won't spend too long on there. We really just reverted to a, a Sort of repair and uh, waterproofing scheme. <clears throat> so coming back to bearings, here was where we challenged the original scheme. The original scheme assumed that these bearings would need to be replaced because of their condition. And as you can see, they look absolutely terrible. But once uh, people got up there and cleaned them, measured them, actually they'd only lost a very small amount of section. They moved um, under thermal movement from monitoring we did. And so we agreed with the RAM that we would leave these as an item that Network Rail could maintain in the future, uh, considering all the new decks and everything that had gone in elsewhere. They were happy to accept that. And also, you know, the, the risk was if we start trying to remove these bearings and put new bearings in, that we're just going to open up more problems when they appear to be working as they are. <clears throat> so moving on, I mentioned uh, continuous fire rail earlier. Um, here was somewhere where we really had to engage our brains. It was a key thing for the Alliance to use CWR because of reduce maintenance and reduce noise. But we also used it in our case to allow redistribution of load around the structure so that we would not have to strengthen all of those retained uh, piers. But uh, CWR can only be used on track with a 338 meter radius, uh, sorry, 1500 meter radius. And on our track, it's 338 meters. So we had to do a dive into the code. Where did these limits come from? And um, come up with our own new limits, which we agreed with 
network rather than the CAT3 checker for these type of curves. And a lot of work was done with our geotech colleagues on the source structure interaction to get that um, full, a full model of the viaduct done, that good model trains running along the viaduct breaking and seeing how load really distributed to the substructures. Um, this is just an image of where we had to do some uh, work to determine the fatigue capacity of the track. Um, and here's an example from the model. Uh, generally, the, the models like this, very simple 2D model with peers modeled, soil stiffness modeled, uh, the track itself modeled. And you run these trains on here, get the, uh, the forces goes down through the ballast into the bridge. And you get out of that, the stress that develops in the track itself. And we need to check whether the track works on the structure with these tight curves. And we also get out though, the forces in the structure, which allowed us to reassess them and get many of them to pass. <clears throat> and here's an extract from the, the full model, which you can see up there and the track stresses that develop and which we check against our limits. So that was a, a sort of a big win for the scheme because it, it removes strengthening from maybe 20 plus peers and allowed us to really concentrate on the work through the West Coast and the Buckingham Road area. So I think I'm going to hand over to Alex now on how we got all of that built. Cracking. Well, thank you very much, Ollie. I'm going to leave you to still hopefully click through for me yes. um, so that it still works. Um, afternoon, everybody. I'm going to run you through now a bit of how we constructed the structure in a little bit more detail, talk about the connection elements um, and also uh, the intricacies of building something so close to the railway. So hopefully uh, we go through there and then there'll be some questions at the end. So next slide, please, uh, Ollie. So first thing um, was the extensive piling that we've done. As Ollie said, we need to try and get as many under the structure as possible. Uh, but due to the very different access capabilities either side of the railway, we had to use different equipment. So on the west side of the railway, we were able to use very large uh, piling, standard rigs in there. Um, but more interestingly, on the eastern side, we had to use segmented um, piling techniques. So that's a Clem 709 in there uh, through the 600 mil piles. And the actual total width for us to work in there is only at its minimum 4.8 meters. So we are very constrained in that location. And due to the ingress of the local residents into railway property in there, we also were required to install a full platform to be able to give ourselves a level of piling. So through there was a very complex and a high tolerance activity building between those two items. And the bottom right hand photo nicely shows a freight train right next to our piling rig and next to the back of Halfords, which is right to the right of the fair. Next one, please, Ollie. So this is the opposite direction, as you can see. Uh, what's also key to see on this one is the sequence of the way the construction happened. So directly behind that auger in the center of the image is the actual OLE mast. So we spoke previously about um, the interface with OLE. A lot of the construction items through here were staged um, and we had to make sure that in addition to SPNC and OLE stages, there were also civil stages to enable things going. Whereas on the other side, you've got a nice big rig there um, and to sort of give you a bit of a comparison of construction times, the segmented element was approximately across 10 to 12 weeks, I think, in the end. Um, and it took us seven days to do it on the opposite side. Um, and there's only sort of 10 piles different. So that's the difference of having some access when you're trying to build something. Next one, please, Ali. So here you go. This is the, the sort of scale of the operation um, within the main compound to the west of the flyover. And you can see to the very right of the screen, the airlow hoarding is installed there. That is a 85 meter long king post wall on either side of the railway with a mixture of uh, timber and debris netting above ground, but below ground were driven uh, 35 mil thick steel plates to enable us access for park up construction, which we will come on to. But what is interesting from a design point of view through here, driven a bit by uh, the construction methodology is we were so close to this wall while we were constructing, 
that actually standard methods of breaking down a pile were not suitable in this area as such a small little innovation there was to enable a plunge uh, polystyrene mold to go on top of each of the pile cages which allows us to displace the top concrete rather than breaking it down and that enabled us to get closer to the ALO hoarding so in that way we were able to maximize uh, the number of elements underneath the structure and you can sort of see through there all the sort of stuff that was in the same compound next one please Ollie so this is the pile cap construction down there um elements in there that was obviously more interesting from a design point of view a number of the foundations uh, that were within the original structure were required to be combined within the new uh, pile cap due to the complexities of trying to remove them uh, adjacent to the railway the one you can see in the bottom left hand screen we actually removed totally to enable the pile cap to go through but uh, one to the uh, sort of north of that location, the park have actually spanned over the top of uh, the park in that area. Um, so creating a more complex uh, design iteration, but we were able to achieve that quite effectively um, with a very close level of design um, and delivery interface. Next one, please, Ollie. So this is the preparation of the park out and again showing this level of the ALO hoarding but here you can actually see the value of the below ground uh, driving of the steel plates uh, that allowed us to work right up against uh, the railway and you can see the box on the opposite side which protects this from members of the public but it does create a lot of complexity when you're trying to get in and out machines that area to the, the right of the photo is only just wide enough for a standard machine to get in there so a lot of the controls as we went through this process was all about how we enable the design but still give ourselves enough working room to actually achieve uh, the output we were looking for next one please sir someone desperately wants to get hold of me um this is where we get down to the piers and this is a bit of my pet project this is the west coast mainline uh, box section so this is the shell abutment solution now previously before i joined uh, the delivery team i worked in r d and we looked to develop a similar solution of this through here this is basically a very large duplo block uh, that stacks on top of each other but the blessing of it is that you have the capability to stack these things to full height um, and then insert cages and concrete within them uh, very close to the railway so you can obviously see in the images there cranes working during live operation with zero disruption to train passengers while still enabling us to complete all 85 meters in under six days so you've got rapid construction and uh, safety to the user um i believe wholeheartedly that the only reason that this was able to be achieved was due to the fact that the design and the delivery team were on site together for the full period of development of this um, and then we were able to go through step by step because i'm sure ollie will attain to this is a very delivery uh, driven element rather than yep. necessarily a very efficient technical element um, but sometimes when you're in a very difficult scenario uh, delivery does drive the overall technical solution uh, next one please ollie so this is showing you how it all slots together. It is uh, fundamentally a large kit of parts, shells followed by columns. Those columns are all pre-manufactured and delivered to site. Cages drop on top of those, and then you drop the concrete in. As Ollie said previously, we make a real strong effort to make sure that all temporary works elements are fitted within the precast concrete components before they arrive on site. And the platforms you can see in the bottom two photos there are a proprietary system designed specifically to fit inside these shell solutions. So it all drops together as you go. Next one, please, sir. Um, interestingly in here, this is uh, to sort of showcase the projection from the pile cap so because you're now having to have a slotting solution one over the top of the other and um, you end up with a lot of projecting reinforcement but within that you have to also be smart to the idea of at what point which way round do you go do you have your inner column over your outer column or vice versa um, and then also looking at how you make sure you don't get clashes as you drop something down so you can see there the guys it's quite tight in there um, and we sort of have the non-interference lap uh, rules in play but it has worked very effectively throughout and i'll talk a little bit about the greater complexities of doing this on the east later so if we just keep going forward sir one more there we go so you can now see them both sides the railway completed um 
and it also then effectively gave us a working room behind that. You can also as well see in the top corner of this photo, all of the beams, all 103 of them, all laid out, ready and prepped on the site in advance of our week five position in which we sought to get these all in. Next slide, please, Ollie. So that's uh, that's where you've got them all in. So this is a lovely photo showcasing all the different DFMA elements in there. So you've got uh, precast shells, precast seals, precast beams, preformed temporary works, all fitted together and to get to the box. To give you an idea of the benefit of all those things working in synergy, uh, piling started on the west on the 4th of January and the beams were completed on the 5th of May. So that is uh, ground to top in sort of a four month window. Next, uh, next Holly, if you don't mind. Yep, so there you can see all the detail of all the beams as they go in, all slotted together. And one more. So this is where you get the sills and the bearings. Sills were probably the last bit. It was the connector between both the beam design, which was going on for a very long time, and then the abutments that came up. And a lot of good work was actually done by the design team to get these all to fit together and also to enable the connection between. There's a large amount of dowels pocketed bearings and shear keys that run all the way along this structure. Um, and that uh, is got a lot of sequence and design. But fundamentally, uh, we got that over the line, didn't we, Ollie, in a very, very tight period of time in the end. And yep, they all sorted in. in together, which is uh, which is the key. Um, spent many, many a night gluing some bearings down, which is always good. And uh, next, next one in there. So this is where you now start to look at the connections. So um, running around the top of the screen, you've got in the center top, that is the dowels in the shells. The idea of this being that the shell acts in a temporary case as a rigid constraint for the column, but in the permanent case, the shells actually have the ability to mildly articulate under load from the bridge. Um, that makes sure that cracking is then distributed along the full length of the internal column rather than at the joints in the shells, which is an element that uh, makes the shell system work. Uh, within the sill beams, you can see there both the dowel holes beneath and then all the bearings being set. Uh, being able to lift and lower sill beams in, in one and have all the stainless steel dowels preloaded um, and slotted in uh, made the connection very easy. But I think in reflection, we'd use a gasketed system underneath the sills. Um, the bottom left hand corner, this is probably one of the most interesting things on the east because the park out was so narrow, uh, we needed to maintain access along the park out. As such, all starter bars that projected from this park out uh, were coupled. To achieve this and to make sure that we had suitable verticality in the correct placement, um, the best way to describe it is a goblet or a sort of a crown was pre-manufactured with all of the couplers attached to it and set into the pile cap. This allowed us to then have free reign over the pile cap during construction, but then have a very rigid um, system for installing and gaining high tolerance with the bars projecting up as we were working to the um, non-contact lap system. So that's really important. And the other two images there you can see is getting the seal beam in place. Next one, please, Ollie. This is obviously showing the details within the shells being fixed together and a bit more about what I was suggesting about the articulation between shells, which is important. And then another one on my really conscious of time. Mm. We're into the final wrap up. So this is obviously when the decks go on. And one of the key elements of this as we go along is that uh, once we've got the beams on, we then need to concrete the deck up, but we also wanted to be able to do this outside of possession and isolation and to also utilize our specialist teams from within the business who are used to doing concreting. So we incorporated and used some of Network Rail's uh, policies to enable um, high street operation. But we also, with the help of Network Rail and the design team, came up with a twin sealing mechanism of the beams. So they were sealed at the toe and they were sealed with permanent formwork at the top of the beams, allowing us to cast concrete during daytime operation. So that bottom left-hand photo is uh, midday. That's nicely pouring the deck slab over the top of the structure. Next one, Ollie. That's obviously the beams going in. We'll keep going for that one. Yeah, nothing more exciting than that. A key element, I think, for everyone to note is whenever we do these things, the project took a very strong policy in trialing everything first. So the first image you just previously saw was a week before the main possession where we installed two beams as a trial. And throughout the entire project uh, it, to construct the BFO, um, we have trialed every single item in advance of delivering it, which has enabled us to 
understand lessons learned and also feed them back through the design process before we then try to do things under the real high pressure areas. Um, next one, please, sir. So this is showing the sills. Keep going. So the one of the pieces of design that was probably the most difficult bit is if you imagine if you build an entire structure um, in a very DFMA way and you've got standard beams all coming together, you eventually get to a corner where you don't have uh, the ability on such a skewed structure to use DFMA simply and you'll always have an in situ stitch, however large. So this was span 24A. Um, and it's probably one of the most complex pieces of uh, reinforcement stitching we had because we had bars in multiple directions entering together to try and tie in this cantilevered section. And to make it equally uh, more exciting and tasty, it was also cantilevering over the railway um, in the way it went and right adjacent to overhead line equipment. Um, as such, this was probably uh, one of the hardest bits to deliver internally, but we had uh, some excellent interfaces with the design team coming down to site. Um, to help us do the final levels of reinforcement in this area. Um, and we have a very close temporary works design team who enabled us to build this projecting cantilevered formwork out over the railway. Um, and importantly, be able to put this in and take it all out again within possession timescales. So you can see in that top central image, uh, a lot of couplers projecting out the side of beams. And that is to enable us to, uh, to work in that railway area. Next one, please, sir. And then the diaphragms. So as we said, all the beams are in, you've got to stitch them all together. Um, this obviously, again, is, is never an easy task and sort of give you an idea between the difference between DFMA and uh, in situ. It took us almost as long to complete the diaphragms as it did to go from piling to the beams. Um, so that, that sort of gives you an idea of trying to fit those two together and the uh, sort of clashing and also tolerance stacking issues that come with multi-directional reinforcement that's in situ. So next one, please, sir. So all the way back to the precast walkways all the way around. So this is a bit of a, a pet thing of the construction team. And this is just to get to that point that if we can make it off site, we will. And we have excellent confidence that we will be able to be interface precast elements together um, to make sure they fit. But also the more you can do off site, the better and the fewer people involved. So the team you can see in front of you, that is all it took to install all 156 um, edge sections by themselves and at all times they never had to be um, stood towards the edge of the structure so all in all all um, significantly better from a safety point of view next one please sir so the final bits we get to now are deck finishing and waterproofing this is probably one of the uh, the darkest of dark arts i feel um, a lot of subjective natures to the waterproofing of a structure but an excellent piece of learning um, I think that came out of this which is sort of a little by accident um, to make sure that we could get the joints in effectively and to make sure they fitted and were watertight all of the retained spans have a small ramp at each joint to make sure that there's no nosing or crushing on the edge um, ironically that actually makes that joint extremely efficient because it sheds all water away from the joint at all times um, and we've chosen a four point drainage system at each location so for for trying to solve one little problem you actually increase the fidelity of the most risky part of your on lowest lifespan element um, quite substantially so um, ironically we don't really do that on the new spans because we're confident with the new <laughs> material um but in in fact if i was to impart any knowledge on anyone i think that's actually quite a smart little detail um which helps no end in the ongoing maintenance of a structure uh, next slide and that's the ballasting so that's where we are at the moment if you were to come to site there is ballast being run up and down all the time and in the next couple of weeks track will go on and we'll be in a, in a good place to start getting uh, trains over here in uh, in february all right thanks alex <clears throat> yeah, we've overrun our time. Don't know if we're okay, but run through these very quick. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the closing summary of what we learned. Uh, <clears throat> these are the, the, the trouble areas on the historic structures halving joints, uh, inaccessible post tension anchorage, <clears throat> possibly ineffective PT. Uh, I think we all know this. The, the existing structures are complex unobvious defects 
you, you need to do a lot of investigation sometimes and assessment to, to really understand what the issues are and what what's what, what you need what the solution is going to be uh, <clears throat> so i know people will be saying well you know uh, this was the original scheme trying to reuse the structure was the original aim and that can be more sustainable but in the end here on this case the, the solution was so complex and intense to achieve over the west coast main line uh, it, it just became too risky to implement so we, we had to use our judgment on when it was better to start again and uh, but even with the rebuild we, we did reuse all of that concrete that was taken down uh, that's really very quick uh, so the lesson was the scope of the work should be open to challenge um, people, you know a year into the project this was challenged and, and a whole new scheme came up with uh, that addressed these vulnerable peers and uh, came up with a solution that could be built within the railway environment. Uh, sorry. Over, over time. Uh, okay, and the big benefit here was on the FMA, which really compressed the, the build time um, that Alex covered. He got it up uh, super quick to hit those um, possession times. Okay, I think I'll... This is more... Uh, about challenging the original scheme, what, what, challenge, challenging everything we're doing. Why, why are we replacing the bearings when actually they're okay? And uh, and then is the scheme really safe, or should we be looking at a different way? Uh, in fact, including whole system safety. So, not just the, the the individual elements, but in this case, there was big risks in there to the the whole thing because of those vulnerable peers. Uh, sorry, I think Alex touched on this. Uh, the the alliance really helped in this case that we were working so closely together over a, uh, a year. Uh, that integrated team really helped, and uh, use of digital delivery uh, helped as well. Uh, sorry for having to whiz through the summary so much there. Um, I don't want to touch schedule. So thank you everyone for listening. Yes, thank you.